Greetings, my fellow free blood sovereign thinkers. This is LL3's newest podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful Swampy Mangroves, South Florida. And today's date, Thursday, June 22nd, 2017. Yes, um, it's nice and warm down here. <laughs> A little breezy at times. And, uh, you know, I'm at CJ's Java Lounge, located at 400 Southwest 1st Avenue, Suite 1, along the beautiful New River. Uh, Fort Lauderdale, which is southwest section of the Andrews Avenue Bridge. Yeah, so, um, I was just checking some of the stuff on Facebook. I do a little research now and then, which I say I do it all frequently, I have to admit that. So, um, when everyone is talking about the Russian ties, Trump this, Trump that, the greatest distractions that the comedy news network and the other lackeys can afford to do. Is out of their own convenience. However, many of them are they actually talking about S Senate Bill twelve fourteen, which is entire combating money laundering, terrorist financing, and counterfeiting act of twenty seventeen. And I'm not gonna I was gonna and actually it was authored by Mr. Grassley, Republican from Iowa. And, of course, Senator Feinstein, Corrin, and White House has co-sponsored it. Ain't that sweet. But um, I will just make this a little bit sincere. The short title of his content and all that gives you a big list. And I like when it says here, on transportation, blank checks, and bears... For purpose of the section, monitor instruments in bear from that has amount left blank, such as the amount could be filled in a bear shop, be considered to a value of more than ten thousand dollars. The instrument was drawn on an account that contained or was intended to contain more than ten thousand dollars at a time. So, the whole thing is allegedly is fighting terrorism. So I'm not going to go read this in its entirety because I have other things I want to focus on. But it's a lot of registration, peeping toms, and if you uh, allegedly, okay, allegedly do things illegally on their behalf, on their views, they can just, boom, you know, take your, take your, uh, hold your money, seize it without judicial due process. And of course, unlicensing currencies such as cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and all that is in this, you can say in this bill as well. So the whole thing is, Bending over, they're bending over for the central banks, and they hate competition. So they are following the Karl Marx legacy on the Communist Manifesto on decentralizing central banking. So this is why, like, if you if you, if they want anything registered, they want to throw if you do this much money in, they want to find out what you're going to do it for. So they're trying to be professional nannies once again. I recommend you call your senators and your elected servants to vote no on the Big Brother bill. You need to tell them to take your technocratic attributes and shove it. And I let uh, let you folks know, I did inform Senator Bill Nelson and Mark Rubio, if you vote on this bill, you're less patriotic than Bennett Arnold. Okay, so I'm going to leave this on my footnotes. You can check this out. And please share with everyone throughout your social media networks, okay? First off, I'm going to actually, um, I haven't really talked about this incident by Phil Alondo Castile. And, of course, he is um, the officer, Ger- Geronimo, Geronimo, Geronimo Yan- uh, Yanez, was found not guilty in shooting him. And what's really disturbing is that Mr. Castile did have a, Concealed weapons permit. He's let the officer know he's armed. And of course, the, according to how I've seen the videos and so forth, looks like Yenis wigged out, shot the man. Of course, he withdrew, he resigned from the police force, and was still found not guilty. And this is really disturbing. Second degree manslaughter. Of course, he wigged out. If it was you and I, if you shoot an officer in self-defense, get him for first-degree murder, full max, throne, and death penalty if necessary without parole. In a lot of the states, they have that certain law. So, 
how come the NRA, the National Rifle Association, hasn't made any statements yet on this? Uh, I'm just curious, in good faith, there's some good folks in that organization, including, uh, what's his the gentleman from Urban Shooter. I always forget. And he, he can smack me later. Sorry, my brother. <laughs> Ken Blanchard. I'm about to hear his views on this. So I'm not going to jump the gun on him because he is a good guy. But um, this was the reason has to, this reason had a statement on here. And, uh, of course, Washington posted the same thing. Some links. It says here, the NRA shuns a Second Amendment martyr. It came out yesterday, the 21st, by Jacob Solom. And from Reason.com, it says here, Philando Castile did what you're supposed to do. If you have a concealed carry permit and get pulled over by police, he let the officer know he had a gun. Had Castile been less forthcoming, he would still be alive. Last Friday, a Minnesota jury acquitted the cop who killed Castile of secondary manslaughter, demonstrating once again how hard is it to hold police accountable when they use unnecessary force. The verdict also sends a chilling message to gun owners. Since Castile is dead because he exercises constitutional right to keep and bear arms, which I have to disagree with the concealed weapons permit to me, it's a privilege, but I will pursue. Geronimo Yanez, an, office, an officer employed by the St. Anthony Minnesota Police Department to stop Castile around 9 p.m. on July 6th in Falcon Heights, a suburb of Minneapolis and St. Paul. The official reason was a non-functioning brake light. The actual reason, according to Yenez, was that Castillo resembled a suspect in a convenience store robbery that had happened four days in the same neighborhood. The full extent of the resemblance was that Castillo, like the suspect, was black, wore glasses and dreadlocks, and had a wide-set nose. Castillo, a 32-year-old cafeteria manager, had nothing to do with the robbery. But, in Yenez's mind, Castillo posed a threat. Assumption, man, kind of, sort of, the way to go. The traffic stop began politely but turned deadly within a minute. And audio and video of the encounter show that Yenez asked for Castillo proof of insurance and driver's license. After Castillo handed over the insurance card, he calmly informed Yenez, Sir, I have to tell you that I do have a farm on me. Yenez interrupted saying, Okay, do not reach for, do not reach for it then. Castillo and his girlfriend, Diamond Reynolds, who was sitting in the front passenger seat, repeatedly assured the officer that Castillo was not reaching for the weapon. But by now, Yenez was in full panic mode. Don't pull it out, he screamed, immediately drawing his weapon and firing seven rounds into the car, heedless of Reynolds and her four-year-old daughter, who was in the back seat, mortally wounded. Castillo moaned. And said, I wasn't reaching for it. Reynolds, who drew nationwide attention to the shooting and reported it via Facebook Live immediately afterwards, has consistently said Castillo was reaching for his wallet to retrieve his driver's license, per Yenes' instructions. Yenes initially said he thought Castillo was reaching for his gun. See, I think. If you and I swim in front of a judge, they'll give us an attitude. But he claimed to have seen Castillo pulling out the pistol, which was found inside a front pocket on the right side of the dead man's shorts. Yenis clearly acted out of fear. The question is whether that fear was reasonable under circumstances and whether deadly force was the only way to address it. Jeffrey Noble, an expert on police procedure, testified that Yenis' actions were objectively unreasonable. The officer had absolutely no reason to view Castillo as a robbery suspect, Noble said, and could have mitigated the threat he perceived by telling Castillo to put his hands on the dashboard or stepping back from the car window. If Castillo planned to shoot Yenez, why would he announce that he had a firearm? That disclosure was obviously aimed at avoiding trouble, but had the opposite effect because Yenez was not thinking clearly. Officers like, officers like Yenez, who is leaving his department under a voluntary separation agreement, poses a clear and present danger to law-abiding gun owners. Yet the National Rifle Association has been curiously reticent about the case. The day after the shooting, the NRA said 
The report from Minnesota are troubling and must be thoroughly investigated, it promised. The NRA will say will have more to say once all the facts are known. Okay, so this is what they wanted to say. That's just, they didn't want to make that statement. The reports have been investigated and the facts are known, yet the NRA has not added anything to the bland, non committable statement it made a year ago. You think the nation's largest and oldest civil rights organization would have more to say about an innocent man who was killed for exercising his Second Amendment rights? I can say this, my friends. I am very disturbed about this. You have an honorable man that had a firearm and he had a, and he had a kid in the ha- in the car. He's going to use it to shoot Yenes. That's one thing you have to really look at. Another police related incident. I'll tell you one thing for sure. People got to be more assertively vigilant when you have governmental delegates like the police pull you over and ask you questions. You don't have to say a damn thing to them. You have the right to remain silent, period. You don't have to even have them look at your vehicle. You can say no if they don't, without a warrant. If they don't like it, too bad. Sometimes you be a gentleman, you get condemned. I don't hear any excuses. There's some claims he may have smoked marijuana, but you know what? I don't give a damn. Mr. Castillo should have been alive regardless. And I recommend Officer Yenes. Not to be in any other police, don't even be a police officer ever again. Be a Walmart greeter for all I care. Because there's some good folks out there who are officers that do care, that have principles. To get a slap in the face because of insecure individuals like him. Something to really look at. But I'm going to continue on here. But, uh, Link, I did put a link on here about the NRA. Gun owners are outraged by Felicino Castillo's case. The NRA is silent. It's by Ev Sleek, June 21st. Came out yesterday. Amid the national fear over the death of um, Philando Castillo at a traffic stop in July, a shooting made more horrific by his girlfriend's Facebook Live broadcast of his final moments. Some condemned the National Rights Association near silence on the matter. The organization has been quick to defend the other gun owners who made national news. Castillo had a valid permit for his firearm. He partly told the officer about the gun to avoid a confrontation and was finally shot anyway after being told to hand over his license. Some NRA members were furious when the organization released a tepid statement more than a day after the shooting that merely called it troublesome and promised that the NRA will have more to say once all the facts are known. A year later, investigations are over, and many more facts are known. Police recordings and court records confirm initial reports that Castile had tried to defuse the situation, assuring the officer that he wasn't reaching for his weapon. On Friday, a, a jury acquitted the officer Geron- Geronimo Yenez of manslaughter. On Tuesday, a video traffic stop was made public showing Castillo calmly telling about the officers about his firearms. Followed within seconds by the officers shooting him and cursing and cursing in what sounds like a panic. So outrage is boiling again. And still the NRA has, has nothing to say. We don't want the NRA to be just for old white guys, a member of the gun group wrote this week on, on Hot Air. One of several right-leaning outlets upset with the organization's failure to speak out on Castillo. It needs to represent everyone who supports and defends the Second Amendment and stays on the right side of the law. Washington Post couldn't find any statement from the NRA about the verdict or video in Castillo, and the organization has not responded for requests for comments since Sunday. Philip 
Smith, who led the National African American Gun Association, said he has seen hasn't seen any NRA statements since July. I've been I've been ready, pretty diligent, he said. It's more it troubles me tremendously when I see a young man following the rules, doing what he's supposed to be doing, and there's still no accountability from a legal perspective. And of course, Jazz Shaw goes, as an NRA member, I agree that the NRA should speak out on a Castillo shooting. This is a travesty. There's a video on that as well. The chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus told the Associated Society Press the jury had effectively told African Americans that Second Amendment does not apply to them. I have to disagree because it applies to everyone. Screw what the state says. A writer for Slate also received no response from the NRA when he wrote about the officer's acquittal, prompting him to write, If Castile had been white instead of black, the NRA would have been rallying behind him and his family since the moment of his death and fundraising off his memory for the rest of time. The group has ignored a request for comment from The Guardian and the outlet wrote, through a track down a prominent black guns right activist, a traditional defender of the NRA, who wrote that verdict, convert racism is a real thing and it's very dangerous. Cole New York told Guardian he was speaking only for, for, for himself, not the NRA. A year ago, the NRA's members were calling out the organization, as Brian Fung wrote for the Post. What do I, why do I pay fees for you if you don't represent gun owners and their rights? One group, one of one, the one wrote on the group's Facebook page. As described in a criminal complaint from Inez trial, the first moment of Castile's traffic Stop right red ring true to Smith's experience as a black gun owner. Black men are feared in this country, he said. They put their hands on their guns and say, don't make any sudden movements. Said he said said he knows the outspoken rules of any police encounter, rules that I go beyond laws and constitutional rights. Definitely don't move at all. He said, keep your hands up on the steering wheel, take baby steps with forward until they're comfortable. In Castillo's case, according to the complaint, he told Yenez, I'm not pulling it out. A few seconds before, Arthur drew his own gun and killed Castillo. We should not. We should all carry a gun now, Smith said. We all have that right. We're not, gonna go, we're not going to let a rogue officer or rogue decision sway us. Anger about the officer's acquittal has managed to unite critics from opposite ends of the ideological spectrum. National Review's David French, for instance, once wrote, it's hard to recall a political movement built on bearable lies and misinformation, Black Lives Matter. But after that, Yenin's verdict, French, French's opinion matched that of Black Lives Matter's protest, he wrote of the officer. Rather, he panicked because of race, simply because of the gun, or because of both. He still panicked and should have been held accountable. He added, the jury's verdict was a miscarriage of justice, and still nothing from the normal, normally vocal NRA, which once released a statement. Two days after the mass shooting in Orlando, destroyed Iraq with Islam, not the, not the right of law-abiding citizens to protect themselves. So you have, from, you have some folks out there on it. So, um, of course, Touch first Nasheed, the second member was grossly violated in this violence account case. Where are you, NRA? But it's not clear when it comes to guns and the race in the United States that Nicholas Johnson, who lectures on the Fordham, Fordham Law School, wrote a book, Negroes and the Gun, and is, and is a black gun owner. Manor Ray has championed black gun rights be- heroes before, Johnson notes, such as Otis McDonald, who fought Chicago's handgun ban. In return, he said the group was accused of exploiting civil rights issues. On the other hand, he said a gun owner still perceived to be kind of an odd minority, in the black community, not exactly a contingency worth angering police over. Your political calculation, I think, the NRA is, okay, so we can come to the rhetorical aid of a mildly despised contingent of a minority that already don't like us, doesn't like us, John said. What's the upside? And I could say this too, you know, I, I'm not going to def- be defensive on a National Rifle Association. However, I will say this. They are considered pro-law enforcement. So you're going to, going to try to use some presentation if they, got, if they should be done it immediately, being critical of rogue officers that will, that, that, consider, that will hurt the cause of the relationship within the communities. Okay. The National Rifle Association should have been a lot more vigilant in this area because it could be anybody. 
not just Castile. Right now, the message is sent. Who's going to be next? It's not just some color thing, race thing. It's an actual individual who has a daughter, who has, who has, a, who has a daughter and, and a girlfriend in the car. And got shot. Now the daughter is traumatized because of some insecure Geronimo Yenes. And the jury sent that message that it's okay for them to shoot and charge them for manslaughter, not first degree or second degree murder. That's totally irrelevant as far as I'm concerned and very discriminatory on anyone. We are not your numbers. We are natural born human beings. To any of those rogue officers out there don't like what I said, to hell with you. Go contaminate space somewhere else. You are nothing more than the disgusting slobs. Insecure parasites. Those are the corrupt ones I'm talking, I'm addressing this to. Including Yenev. You're a thug based on your actions. And I guarantee you one thing. Some places, if you're going to be an officer that's more pro-gun state, you may, you may get a lot more you can chew on. People won't forget this. I guarantee you that. This is why I'm a little bit ticked off about it. It could be any one of us. If everyone put that Think, let that sink in. An honorable individual gets shot. I don't know the gentleman Castillo myself, but I've seen the video enough times. He was being a gentleman. It was unacceptable. Voluntary dismissal. Please. Your times will come, folks. It's happening in Detroit. It's going to happen in your town. When you got rogue, corrupt individuals, insecure ones out there. And of course, we talk about the police, train them to arrest many people as possible. Use them, arrest citizens as for revenue collecting. Or take them out, doesn't matter. We'll protect you. When all your, when all your pensions get washed away, it will be a lot worse for you folks that are especially corrupt, mainly the corrupt within this institution. And the National Rifle Association, I recommend to the members out there, don't toss in your cards. That's too good. Petition the crap out of them. Ask them, how come you're not going by your bylaws? Folks, you should be running for these positions. Get these sleaze bags out of there. These touchy people. Oh, I'm so sensitive. I'm not a member of the National Rifle Association. I'm not here to condemn the, everyone in that organization by any means. I was for a while, but I see some of the shady stuff, stuff I'm not too fond of, because I don't believe in compromising. I believe in destroying gun control. My rights are natural-born, period. I'm a lifetime member of Guardians of America. I have no shame of it. I'm proud of what they do. I have my disagreements with Larry, too, in good faith, but the main objective, no compromise. By any means. So you folks out there. Don't be afraid of carrying. Even in your vehicle. Because one thing for sure. The police aren't obligated to protect you. Fulfill his legacy. By keep the movement going. Doesn't matter what you look like. Don't use that white privilege on me. Because I don't need permission. That's all I have to say. I'll be digressing. <laughs> All right, next one here came from shtfplan.com. Came out yesterday by Daniel Lang. Law, Republican lawmakers want to make it legal to carry a gun in Washington, D.C., but only for congressmen. When it comes to the gun control, no, more, no one is more hypocritical than liberal celebrities and politicians. While these people promote the end of gun rights for ordinary Americans, it is often the case that they are protected in public and in their homes by cadres and highly trained armed bodyguards. They reap the benefits of the Second Amendment while treating the rest of us like children who can't be trusted with the gun. However, 
It is not just a prominent liberal who are hypocritical when it comes to gun rights. Republican Congressman Mo Brooks, who survived the recent shooting in Virginia that left Congressman Steve Scalzi severely injured, has been promoting a new bill that will allow lawmakers to carry a gun anywhere in the country, including Washington, D.C., regardless of local laws. The only exception are when lawmakers are in the U.S. Capitol building or in the presence of the president or vice president. I'm going to be introducing a legislation this week allowing congressmen to carry a sidearm should they so desire, Representative Mo Brooks said in an interview with Maria Bartiromo on Fox News Sunday on Sunday's Morning Futures. Members of Congress are high-profile targets, the congressman said, adding... They have obviously no way to defend ourselves because of Washington, D.C.'s rather restrictive gun laws, the Alabama congressman said. I want congressmen to be treated as they were law enforcement, Brooks said. Given given that we are high-profile targets for bad guys, the lone wolves, the terrorists. Oh, yeah, and everyone else are pissants. Thank you very much, congressman. That makes sense. Politicians are high-profile individuals who routinely face death threats from members of the public. They should obviously have the right to arm themselves in public. But what about everyone else? What would it say about our country if this bill passes? Lawmakers should have a special right to carry a gun wherever they want, that they are above the local and state laws that keep millions of Americans from protecting themselves in public. Politicians are supposed to have the same rights as us. They are not special in that regard. But some of Brooks's recent statements might suggest that he likes he thinks otherwise. <clears throat> Brooks said the measure does not include any particular training or requirement Requirement for members. In an interview with WHNT News uh, 19 Tuesday afternoon, he said members are capable of deciding on their own if they need a firearm, if they need any firearms training. I defer to the judgment of our elected congressmen and senators. Brooks said they are adults, they are targets. They are high-profile targets of terrorists and lone wolf attackers, and such as they are in position to make their own decision about how much training they believe is necessary. But our judgment can't be trusted. Last I heard, most Americans have to undergo some of training if they want to receive a concealed carry license. But congressmen suddenly don't need training? Sorry, but I could think of, of, of a few politicians who would, like, who would make me nervous if they were packing. If they're mature of enough to make the decision themselves, then so is every other adult American. The point I'm trying to make isn't that the isn't that the bill is wrong. I don't think politicians should be allowed to arm themselves in public, and I don't think they should have to beg the government for permission to carry a gun. But neither should the rest of us. That's exactly what um, what millions of Americans have to do. If they want to conceal carry, depending on where they live, they need to pay fees, obtain permits, go through background checks and undergo training before they can carry a gun. They have to convince the government they are responsible adults before the government gives them permits to exercise their rights. They don't they don't get to decide for themselves if they have enough training. It would be absolutely sick if political class didn't have to jump through the same hoops that many of us have to jump. Through a up to obtain a concealed carry permit. The bottom line is this: whether you're a politician or a private citizen, nobody in America should ever have to beg the government for permission to carry a gun in public. It is a right that should that should be taken away from citizens who abuse it, criminals. But nobody should need permission in the first place. Congressman Brooks, if you really support the Second Amendment as you eloquently claim after the shooting in West in Virginia, then you promote laws that enhance everyone's rights, not just the rights of your colleagues. There you go. I have to agree with it 100%. And the truth of the matter is, my friends, it's a right, not a privilege. It's a natural right. And like I tell everybody, I recommend you folks on your own free will to get the training Better yourselves when you carry or have it on you. The more you know, the more confident you'll be, and you and you be more methodical. That's how I see it. Because everyone that owns a gun or carries it has have to exercise a higher standard. 
period. But if, if they're going to use it for, con- for, for elected servants only, scrap it. Null and void, Mr. Brooks. That authorization, if you're going to talk about that, you, you choose poorly. Remember, we're a natural minions. All right. Finally. This came out yesterday. By the Miami New Times. R.I.P. R.I.P. Lindell Trocard. Blue Note Records expert and Miami Music Guide by Abel Flagor. This is a commentary. came out yesterday at 9.30 a.m. And um, before Spotfly, before iTunes, even before Napster, Blue Note Records was a South Florida music mecca. Quietly operating in the corner across the street from 163th Street Mall in North Miami Beach, the shop was home to an ad hoc of army of music lovers who were integral members of the local scene and tastemakers. Lendro Cordell was more than just an expert at the store. He was an encyclopedia of good music, regardless of genre, and was always happy to make suggestions and steer casual buyers in the right direction, turning them into lifelong customers. More news of this death has sent Miami's music scene into mourning. Exactly, it is. Lendell was a very kind soul who personally lit up the room when he entered enter it. Tom Bowker, former drummer and manager of Blowfly, says he was the music scene champion with a 17-year tenure at Bob's Perry Store, a good run at Columbia Records doing promo and several kinds of promotions. Bowker famously helped Troll Card fix his car after he drove. Sorry about this. I'm just trying to take care of a few things here. Drove. Uh, one moment. Oh, sorry about that. And um, and it says here, Balker also famously helped Ricard fix his car after he drove into a canal for a much publicized benefit concert. I remember that too. Talking New York hip hop, punk, and metal to a car played between rooms at stores with limber grace that gives skinny frame a solid presence. He piled up records into people's arms, I think for the residents, Captain Beefheart, the Germs, and beyond. I can say that too. <laughs> he spread the news for upcoming concerts who was so hot, who was not local fans of today and yesteryear. He acknowledged, went on and on and on. Trocar was equally adored and cherished outside the store. Friends loving nicknamed him Chocolate String Bean. Balcor teased him about his skills on the road and placed Trocar on his list of the five worst Miami drivers, a tough group to crack. Trocar even has his own catchphrase Nothing but guts. Born from legendary live mixtape DJ party sessions that is happily remembered by a few. If the cell phones and YouTube has been around, Trocar would have been a viral menace. Sometimes he would fall asleep at boring concerts or in the booth at Steve's Pizza in Miami, but it was okay. He had uh, he had smiled of that warm everybody on his heart and sense of humor match, and by lighting fast, which throw card was a G. Sometimes he would fall. Mm, sorry about that. An ambassador of music, he was diplomatic from passing out flyers outside Churchill's pub to addressing quietly an unruly, slammy crowd. Trocar commanded respect and admiration for his dedication to South Florida's music scene. I remember that show too. That was it was actually right here. Which would be this would be Squeeze Club right where the yacht club is. And it was around around uh, I think it was the September of ninety seven, something like that. And a little disturbance broke out and <laughs> and uh Lindell just had that microphone and go, wait a minute, rabies from Warzone passed away. This is how you gonna pay your respects? But it was great. You know, he had that heart and soul had, had principles in those areas. So I will continue on here. This is my 52nd year in the record business. With 25 plus years as a record promoter and 25 in retail, says Blue Note Record, Bob Perry. I hired Lindell in 10 minutes in 1984 after my first meeting to expand the store into punk and alternative. He has such a passion and knowledge of all that was related to punk, funk, soul, jazz, hip-hop, hardcore, and metal. His contribution to our 25-year music retail survival is immense. May his memory be internal. 
No one is immune to his life kicks and for Trocard after his mother passed away. Life seemed to despair, spiral. Over the years, he became distant and shunned in. He fell apart and away from the scene and from his friend. He fell on hard times, and though many who knew him now wish they had help, they probably would have would have been able to. Trocard passed away 29th September 2016 of a seizure. His body was unclaimed, and he had largely lost touch with his friends, which is why we found out nearly nine months later, Balker explains. News of his death has spread like a digital wildfire across the social media to the surprise and sadness of his friends. Everybody who came up loving music in South Florida chim- chimed him with the same song. Lindo Trocard was a great dude, nothing but guts, and the Miami scene will never have a person like him. Wherever your faith makes you believe, he's ended up here, there, telling people what's good and what hot artists are coming to town. Rest in peace, brother. That was a beautiful commentary and um, flawless, I would say, too. I knew Lindell Trocard during that time. And I remember one day, he brought me to the, he brought me to, he, he brought me to, I think it was at the, one of the clubs, he saw some guy wearing a screwdriver shirt. Him and I did a song to go, stick out, go, oh, make big, it had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and we just started ragging on this guy. And he, 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 he laughed, he just sang along with me, and we just laughed about it. Hating the people like that too good. We just ridiculed him in front of everybody. We didn't really care. But one thing about Lindell, because I remember the time he was homeless, I was trying to make sure he's okay. He said, no, no, he'll take care of himself. It's a real disheartening to hear that, you know, that he passed. Because an even person like myself would give him a hand in those conditions. And it's a really shame that um, he died. And this is why I always tell folks, you know, hey, love one another the best you can. And we and we all have our moments. There's times I may make I make my mistakes too. I made my and my errors of judgment on folks, and I admit that, and I apologize to them as well. So this is why, my friends, you live once, you value it. And Leonard Trocard was high spirit, free spirit individual in the South Florida music scene. May your soul, may your soul be forever free, my friend. I love you, and you never be forgotten. Now that is it, my friends. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share this throughout your social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, or you're going to send me something that's interesting and we want to check out, whatever you do, please address your correspondence with the quorum. You can hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Breaker, iHeartRadio, Tumblr, YouTube, Scene.Life, Minds.com, FutureNet, or Patreon.com forward slash Lucky Luck Third, L3 Eyes. If not, you can email me at LokiLuck3 with the number three all together at gmail.com or to encrypted types, LokiLuck03 at protonmail.com. All right, my friends. Once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the demoniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love. May your guardian spirits be with you. Mm-hmm.